talking and let and then let the the attendees in and Eugene, when you get in order with being the host, um, make Susan being co-host, just let me know when we'll start. Okay, um, Susan co-host, all right. Okay, you're getting the first person ready. Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll begin then. This is Community Board 2 Manhattan, the first of two Landmarks Committee meetings for the month of March. And before we start, just a few um, items we have. I know some new presenters tonight. Um, the applicant will make the presentation followed by comments by the committee, then the board members, then guests, and then the public. The public uh, will be up upgraded one at a time by Eugene, according to uh, raised hands, and um, a two minute maximum, please, for comments. The applicants uh, should state the address of the property. And uh, we have, have a reasonable expectation that what is presented tonight is close to what will be presented to the commission um, in the hearing next week or if it's later. And if changes are made based on our recommendations, it's not necessary to come back. If the large changes are made for other reasons, um, we should rehear it at the committee meeting next month so that we're essentially passing along information about what's being presented. The Landmarks Committee hearings, uh, this is primarily for the public, um, are only for landmark matters associated with an application. And if there are other considerations that have to do with it or the property, um, contact the community board office and you'll be directed either to the correct committee or to a city agency for your question. The testimony must be given at this public session and before the business section to be considered in formulating the resolution. Um, that's true of the public or anyone else. Um, in the business session, only members of the <coughs> only members of the committee may participate. And at the beginning, we invite members of the board to make final comments. Um, everyone is welcome to stay and listen in on the Zoom. And uh, with that, we're ready to begin. If the first application is from 391 Sixth Avenue, application to install signage. Okay, my promoted um, Lydia uh, Jimenez. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Jimenez, yes. Jimenez, okay. Um, you should be allowed to share your screen. So if you have any materials, um, please use the, sh the share screen button at the bottom. And uh, you should be able to share an application or document uh, with the committee. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, today we're presenting on 391 Sixth Avenue. Uh, it's a one story building located between Waverly Place and Christopher Street. This is the existing conditions with the previous tenant, Wenjin. 
And today we're proposing the Orange Theory Fitness sign. The awning has been approved by Landmarks and the sign band behind the sign has been approved along with the facade remedi remedi remediations. Um, today we're here due to the orange O splat logo, uh, Landmarks has an 18 inch height restriction uh, guideline and we're proposing a 28.69 inch. The remaining letters are at 11.76 inches and 7.46 inches. The sign itself is only 40% of the backgrounds of the sign bands, where we're allowed 90%. So this is the historical Greenwich, uh, Greenwich Village Historical District map, along with the New York City Oasis. Here are some changes over time. Uh, this is the 1940s tax map, which uh, is a totally different building. Sometime in 1955, it was uh, altered to a one-story building, which is shown here in the 1969 LPC Luna map. Here we have the Department of Finance 1980s photo map showing the lettering with the sign band over it, the awning and the curved entryway. And then over time, we have the 2009 Google map of the Uno Chicago Grill, the 2012 Google map of the Wenjin, which is the previous tenant. And this is what it looks like today. This is with the new awning and the curved and painted building. Uh, the sign band has not been installed yet. We're waiting to find out the, uh, you know, if we have to do any modifications to the sign before we can install the sign band. Citibank is the adjacent, adjacent tenant along with Club Pilates. I included a sample of the orange fitness sign at a separate location. Here, the orange fitness sign is at 90% of the sign band. We're only proposing the 40% of the sign band. Uh, this is what we're proposing. Um, thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Okay, have you completed? Hello? Hello? Yes, have you finished? Yes. Oh, um, I, I want to be sure you're not asking for any variance. You were just saying how you fit within the regulations, yes? Uh, we do not fit within the regulations for the one letter, which is that O splat logo here. And and in what way are they saying it's not in the regulations? Uh, the the letter height has to be eighteen inches, but due to their corporate branding, if we reduce that to the eighteen inches, you won't see the other letters. Okay. Um, are there questions from the committee? Other questions from board members? No, uh, sorry, Chenault. I oh. have a, I have a question okay. to the uh, applicant. Can you explain why you wouldn't see if you reduced that uh, orange logo splat? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you see it if it were eighteen inches rather than whatever it is that you've asked for? If we reduce the orange splat to the eighteen inches, the other letters will go down to four inches due to the scaling of the, the logo and the branding. So they could be that size. You just choose not to adapt your logo. I mean, not you choose just not to adapt your logo to accommodate the regulations in the historic district, but it, it's not that it physically can't happen. It's just that you would prefer for it not to happen. Is that correct? Well, yes, because the sign will be a lot smaller. Um, and if you look at the facade of the building and that sign bands, if it's a lot smaller, um, you would be able to see it, but would it look in scale to the building? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, other questions from the committee or the public? Um, Albert's hand is raised, Albert. There we go. Can you hear me now? 
the example that you showed us of the, the sign at another location is that identical to the one that you were proposing? The style of the sign, yes. However, we're taking up 90% of the band as opposed to only 40% of the band. And where was where is that located? I don't have that address. That's it. Um, okay, could you go back to, to the drawing? I think it's the next slide after this. Okay. Um, this, uh, just to be clear, the size of the sign is within regulations, right? Yes. So yes. that it fits between the awning and the top of the building. Correct. And um, it appears to me that the, the difficulty is simply that the orange reaches too close to the edge of the side. So if it were reduced a bit, never mind what the proportions are, if it were just reduced enough that it was uh, from 28, whatever it is, to something like 25 even, that would leave more of a breadth around this at the top and the bottom. Um, would that not be an acceptable way of um, keeping the idea that it's bigger than the other letters? But we would, have, yeah, we would have to scale that out. That, that's just a, a suggestion. We'll, we'll discuss it more in the um, business meeting. And these are not illuminated like the other sign, right? These are halo lit. Oh, okay. That's that's not clear from this. Okay, can we then go back to see the uh, example from the other location that you showed? Okay, so that um, that I believe is a standard way that we've seen signs before. Um, are there any other questions? Um, any from the public, Eugene? Um, yes, we have um, Pete Davies and also Jeffrey Rowland. I'll promote Pete to allow talking. Great, thank you. So if um, the O in orange were simply reduced, not reducing all the letters, that would fit within the, I understand being a slave to the branding is uh, one option but to comply with the regulations if the O in the orange was reduced by itself, that could fit, correct? Or that's, that's a question for the committee. Thank you. And um, I think it's overkill. Also considering the orange uh, awning, I think we're gonna know it's orange is what they're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Um, next, we have a question from Jeffrey Rowland. Hi, I, uh, I'm in agreement with Pete. I, it seems to me that if the O from orange was reduced to the same uh, size as all of the other letters, um, instead of being a capital letter uh, and appearing as a capital letter, that that would shrink the logo down and it seems like a reasonable compromise if you hope to have the, uh, even if it were slightly larger than what's allowed at LPC, if you hope to seek any kind of variation or variance from this committee, I would think that they would want you to at least reduce it to, to the same scale of letters as the rest of the text, uh, which would then bring in the, um, the edges of the, the loco. Uh, to reduce it somewhat. And that seems like a reasonable compromise to me. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Are there other members who wish to speak? I want to be clear about the illumination. That was not approved at the staff level, was it? The illumination is fine. It's halo lit. I'm sorry, it was approved by them? 
It, it is approved by LPC. The only thing that came up uh, for the, the, the size of the is the size of the logo. Size of the, logo the size of the logo letter is all that's the force. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next application. Uh, Eugene, if you can rearrange the people. 101 Green Street application to replace an existing banner sign with a flag. Great, I've uh, promoted Bill. Um, I have another last name I'm gonna mangle, Bill Mano Liadis. Correct. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, shall I share my screen now? You should yes, have that. Yep. Okay. This is um, a copy of our application that we sent in. The address as stated before is 101 Green Street between Prince and Spring. Um, the application is to replace the existing bracket sign with a, uh, a flag bracket sign instead of the, uh, the solid one that's there. Um, these are some images of what's there presently. Um, the Bottega Veneta store is here to the right of Fendi. Um, this is the existing bracket sign. As you can see, it's solid. Um, solid metal reflective with the Bottega Veneta sign on it. Um, this is the building uh, as a whole down here. And then these are just some uh, street views of what's, what's already on the block. Um, and as you can see up and down the street, there are existing um, flags in lieu of solid bracket signs. And those are the most predominant signs on the street. Personally, um, in my opinion, you could see the Tiffany, the Fendi, uh, these flags across the street that are, are much larger than, than the ones I mentioned before. Um, and our sign is somewhere in here between the Fendi and the three Dior signs that are down the street. Here's the three Dior's that are there now. And then this is the view from Green Street um, north of Bottega. So there's the Bottega sign sort of disappears. It's right, it's right in here and there's a Dior sign. So um, what we're proposing is keeping the existing armature. This is a rendering of what's being proposed. So the existing uh, mirrored uh, bracket sign that's there now would be replaced by a fabric sign of the same size, two foot by three foot, which I believe is the limitation on the bracket signs on in this district. Um, the armature would remain, the wooden armature that's there, the bracket that's holding the wooden armature to the building would remain. The only thing that would be replaced is the actual sign that's there now with the fabric sign that could be seen in the rendering. That's the extent of our presentation. Sir, you're finished? Yes, sir. Um, the, the, um, then it's evident, but I need to write it down. That sure. You're representing that the sign is within the regulated size for the district. Correct. The difference it's is falling, that the, falling within the range of other approved signs. Right. Uh, the, this signs, is, yes. the LPC can re approve it at a staff level because other than um, a solid bracket sign for the material is not is not approved. Um, it's not that they don't exist in the district and especially on the street, you can see them up and down. Oh, yes, but, we're frequently, yeah. We're frequently. yeah, staff level just couldn't approve it. And we, you know, we're going through the through the process of presenting to you this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, are there questions, comments from the committee? Yes, I have my hand up. Chenault? Yes, to speak. Okay. Yeah, uh, number one, I just want to challenge your statement that um, they're mostly, I believe you said most of the signs are not bracket signs, but they are flags. That's 100% that's untrue. So let's assume that you're mistaken on that. Um, the Soho area is characterized by bracket signs. That's that's the go-to look. It's bracket signs. It, that's what's what's allowable, and that's what you should have. The it, uh, on occasion, uh, um, flags have have slipped through, but that's not the preference. And uh, I would submit that this should be uh, rejected, and uh, you should. Just continue with your bracket sign. Thank you. Are there other comments? 
Yes, hi, um, I'm Anna, I, I work in Bottega, I'm, I'm working along with uh, Bill. Um, thank you both for your feedback. Um, we we want to, um, the bracket, it's gonna remain as it is, we're just changing the blade signage for a flag. That will be our change, to be aligned with the rest of the retail. Well, maybe, well, maybe the terminology is maybe I'm. Well, we, we don't need to discuss back and forth. Well, I need to. I need to clarify my statement. We're not discussing anything. I'm just simply stating I may have misrepresented um, what I meant. Now, if you're, I my understanding is that a blade sign is uh, projects from from the uh, front of the storefront, and there's. Okay. So I didn't understand the the qualification that you just made. We're changing, you see the blade signage for a fabric signage. The armature remains as it is. We're just changing the blade signage you're seeing right now, which is, you know, shiny, it's it's uh, gray, and it's in it's it's material for a, a fabric flag. That's it. The armature remains as it is. It's no, no, I understand that. No, I thought you were suggesting something else. No, 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 no. no it's just, if, if, just if it's clear, if it's clear, we'll move on then. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Um, and move on if there are from the public, please. There uh, not, I not see any. I do not see any. Okay. Um, then uh, thank you, and we'll move on to the next application. Thank you. The next application is 350 Bleecker Street to paint the storefront portion of the facade a white color to install a bracket sign and signage with a polished gold finish. Um, this application was before us before, and um, we understand that there are modifications which are not altogether clear from the description. So if you would please make the presentation of simply the changes that have been made. And um, if you have slides that will show what you presented before and how that has changed, that would be useful. And um, I'm going to ask Susan, who conducted the hearing initially, to uh, care for this. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Mr. Spence. May I go ahead and share my screen? Please, thanks, Jackie. OK. OK, can everyone see 350 Bleecker on your screen? Yep. OK, great. Um, thank you, committee members, for hearing this application tonight. I will try to be brief and be as, uh, you know, as Mr. Spence directed, I'll, I'll try to highlight just what has changed. Um, this project is 350 Bleecker, a wild blue store. You last saw this on the gen at the January 10th meeting. Um, certain mistakes were made and also part of the scope of work was determined by Landmark staff to be able to be uh, eligible for a staff level approval. So therefore we're showing this to you again. Uh, the proposal is to paint a portion of the facade around the storefront white. That has not changed. To install pin mounted polished gold finish letters. Um, on both elevations, that has not changed. And uh, to install uh, uh, polished gold signs behind the glass at the door and the side light, that has changed. That's a new part of the scope of work. And um, as I noted, this bracket sign, which was previously shown to you, is no longer something that we need you to comment on because again, Landmark staff determined that it was now at its current placement and size meets all applicable zoning and landmarks rules, and therefore does not need to be approved at public hearing. So again, what we're asking you to weigh in on is the, um, the pin mounted signs, the white paint on the facade, and these signs that are behind the glass here at the door and the side light. And uh, I should note, this is the existing condition in the left, uh, left photograph. So, uh, 350 Bleecker is a building without a style designation in the designation report. It was constructed in 1963. It's located on Bleecker between Charles and West 10th. The location of the proposed work is on the southeast corner of the building, or another way to think of it is at the northwest corner of Bleecker and West 10th. Here's the building in its existing condition. Um, it's so large, I couldn't get all of it into one shot, so that's why it's split in two here, but this is the, the view on Bleecker Street. 
And here you see the, the uh, location at the corner of Bleecker and West 10th on the far left. Again, existing condition photos. Uh, please note the difference in color of the brick between the dark banding above, the dark banding on this built-in planter over here, and what you see now at these two storefronts. Existing condition photos again. And this is uh, looking at the West 10th Street side of the building. Historic photos showing you what the building looked like at, at designation. Um, and here's a close-up photo of what it looked like at designation. This was not previously in the presentation. Now, to recap, uh, summer of 2022, a permit was issued for signage uh, on, this, on this building um, at this location. The pin-mounted signage that they got approved and it and is installed is smaller than what they're asking for tonight. In addition, at some point, as you can see the difference between these two photos, at some point, this um, storefront and extending to the neighboring um, the neighboring storefront, the the areas of dark banded brick were painted a very dark gray color, and that was done by someone without a permit. So when the Landmarks Commission reviewed this work last summer. They said, okay, we'll give you the signage, but as part of the permit, you also have to have the paint removed from the facade because it had not been permitted. Consequently, um, the paint removal process also took off a good portion of that dark finish that was on the brick. So you can see that in these comparison photos here. Again, 2009 on the top left, 2021 on the bottom left, and on the right is a close up of the current condition of what this this area of the storefront looks like. And this is a close up of that um, area of masonry above the storefront doors and windows. You can see where you know, there's been bad brick, uh, brick replacements made, um, how that dark finish has been thoroughly removed from most of the brick, an area of bad concrete patching of a crack right underneath where the wild blue sign is. Um, this is the West 10th Street elevation where uh, likewise, the removal of the finish on the brick is not as bad, but uh, it is very still somewhat mottled and blotchy. You can also see uh, bad uh, replacement brick repairs that were made. Um, and so that so this is the proposal to paint this portion of the facade to create a more uniform, clean appearance to the storefront area. This is what uh, it would look like at night because again, this, the signs would be pin mounted and halo lit. This is an elevation drawing of what's existing and what is existing is a, for the paint, the, the pin mounted letters is a four foot, six inch wide sign. And what they want is a sign that is um, five foot, three inches, five foot, three and three quarter inches long and also 22 inches high. So the sign would be getting slightly taller and wider by almost a foot. Sorry, how long did you say? I just can't see it. I know, it's. I'm sorry, I'll show, I'll show it to you in a, um, I have a detailed drawing to come, but the proposed sign length is five foot three and three quarter inches long and 22 inches high. Okay. Landmarks rules. Landmarks rules allow for a sign that's 18 inches high, so that's what was approved and what's installed now. Um, and so they're asking for a sign that's slightly taller and slightly longer. Also, and also with a polished gold finish, rather than the matte gold finish that it has now. And if you'll note here uh, on the the glass door and the transom, I'm, I'm sorry, side light next to it. Um, these are gold foil uh, signs, which they want to have applied to the back of the of the glass. So here is the ex uh, existing elevation for West 10th Street and the proposed for West 10th Street, also noting the, ex the extent of the facade painting. Um, here's the, a detailed drawing for the uh, halo lit pin mounted letters. This is a sample of the polished uh, gold finish they would like on, this on the letters, sample of the white paint, and a section drawing showing, um, showing the detail of the, of the halo lit sign. Uh, and here are uh, drawings showing these, um, these foil signs that they'd like to apply to the back of the, the glass. One with just is just an 
open or closed sign and one is store hours sign. And now for context, this is just what the street looks like on the opposite side of, uh, of Bleecker Street. And this is what West 10th Street looks like uh, going down both uh, north and south sides of the street, just for context. Um, also for area context, uh, looking around for other large buildings with, um, with painted ground floors. This is 95 Christopher Street, AKA 330 Bleecker Street. So um, about a block away, you also have um, a building with, um, with white paint at its base. Um, also for context, this is 100 Perry Street, which is the other side of it is 97 Charles Street. Uh, and also two other buildings on Bleecker Street with white painted bases. These are uh, two other buildings from circa 1960 that have different colors uh, at their bases. Um, this is 15 Charles Street, which has white, uh, white finished masonry on one elevation at, at its base, and 33 Greenwich Street, which has um, consecutive storefronts that are painted either with white or cream or, or black. And um, that's it to conclude. And I welcome your questions and comments. This is a Mayas. Albert, go ahead. I see your hand is up. Um, may I ask a couple of things from my notes before? Oh, of course, of course. Um, the note the, goes the letters, um, are they illuminated from behind or from above? You showed them at night. <laughs> the, the pin mounted letters on each side, on each elevation? They're illuminated from behind. They're pin. They will be. I'm um, sorry. They'll be halo lit, pin mounted letters. So it's a halo kind of thing that follows the script. Yes. Okay, uh, that's fine. Thank you, Susan. Okay. You want to see the nighttime view again? Hang on. So it'll, you know, so the light will shine behind the letters themselves, back at the masonry, really. Albert, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, we talked about this last time. Mm -hmm. The planter is definitely going to be painted white. Is that, that is part correct? of the proposal. Yes. Okay. It, it previously had a black finish on it. Um, I mean, not black, but like a dark gray finish that was on the brick. And that's unfortunately been removed from the brick um, when it you know, when they remove the paint that had been put on without a permit. So um, when I say unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, this dark finish was taken off the brick when when the brick was cleaned and the paint was removed. Um, so that's part of the reason why they're proposing to also paint the planter is to create a uniform appearance again for this portion of the storefront. Okay, that's why you said unfortunately. I thought you were agreeing with me that it should be a brick. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to just ask, I assume that there's no lighting with those uh, proposed foil signs, but I know. Okay. No, they can't. I mean, no, there's just, it's just shiny gold foil that would be behind and attached, you know, attached to the glass from behind. Okay, thanks. Albert, is your hand still up or do you have another question? You're muted. Albert, Albert. you're muted. You're still muted. There you go. No, you're still muted. But we'll come back to you, Albert. Um, Chenault, is your hand still up or is it up again? No, it, it's up. It's up as a member of the committee now. Um, Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, first of all, the, the planter, is, is that, it's hard to see from this drawing, mm -hmm. is that simply the planter in front of the windows that continues to the part that is the storefront or is it in some way distinguished architecturally? I can't uh, maybe I should, uh, why don't I get to photos again of that shows yeah, you the planter better. So, okay, so here's the planter, right? So it's it's kind of its own planter that just extends in front of this 
particular yeah. storefront. And it matches, except that there's a door of the adjoining premises in between. Right. Okay. Right. And um, so, I mean, it was just it would just be this planter that right. they're proposing to paint. Right. Um, if you go back to the um, the one that was up, this uh, the red ring. You showed examples of a number of of white bottom buildings. Are there any others that, if you will, arbitrarily cut into whiteness? No, sir, not that I've found. Because um, a, there's no architectural thing that says this is the beginning and the end. It indeed is just the. Right. I mean, the closest I could find are these two buildings where at the bottom of 33 Greenwich, there's a, a, a section of stores that are, have a white trim around them. And then at the middle of the building, they have a cream color trim. And that and building the, was a mess anyways. <laughs> right. But it's 1960 and it was, you know, it's comparable in terms of period for this building. And so the then Charles, at the end, it's painted black. Mm -hmm. the, the Charles Street treats the entire facade on that side of the building away from the restaurant. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, I found that a little disturbing. Um, is it possible to change out or paint the air conditioner? Thing? We've got the problem uh, of sort of imposing something again on the building in the way it wasn't meant to be imposed. So we have the air conditioners from the apartments in um, the area of the thing. And um, that seems troubling. I, if they were white or or of white whitish metal mm -hmm. it would make a, a great difference in not having okay it. that's that's not a question that's come up for us before so i appreciate the question and um uh you know i'll talk about it with the project team and with the landmarks commission and see what they say okay um well um, if the committee agrees we'll include that in the in the uh, recommendations um, are there questions? Yeah, Brian, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, from uh, the last presentation, I remember that was a, a very big issue that the white of the paint was too white. It was showing different shades of white in various renderings. And I was particularly uh, curious to see, it, you showed an example of the decorator white paint mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but you don't show the uh, window white but in the rendering you could see the difference and it's more like the paint is creamier white but the sample of decorator white is definitely mm -hmm. a very bright white so i i see a discrepancy i i don't think mm -hmm. i could approve that unless it's shown this this difference between the paint and the frames is in fact as remarkable as this rendering. Well, all I can say is they did intend to make this white to match the decorator white, and I thought we had corrected the problem with the color from last time, but maybe not. Um, I'm gonna go back to that paint sample. Okay, I see what you're saying. It still doesn't look white white. Um, let's look at the, I mean, the, the intention is to match the color of the frames. So I, I think, and these are definitely white. I mean, they're dirty, but they're white. They're not cream. So, um, I think we just have to take a look at how the rendering is being done again. How can we describe the intended color of the brick paint? Dead white or <laughs> Blanc cassé, or <laughs> if it's going to be different from what the those the the windows there look pure white, I'd just like some way to describe it in the resolution. I am concerned because this was a very big issue for us last time, and we very I think we were very clear when we spoke about it last time. Mm -hmm that this decorator white 
was not at all close to what was in the rendering. And since it, frankly, it's already a very big ask to go that light on the ground floor in a in a this kind of abrupt way. Um, the fact that all these weeks later, you know, that knowing that this is a big issue for us, that this application has not changed and that the rendering still demonstrates one color while the paint sample is another. And I'm further confused by the fact that if the intention is to match the existing window, then there's no way it could be even this cream color because, you know, although it's a dirty white, it is clearly a white. I mean, I just walked by there this afternoon. It hasn't changed from the true white that it is uh, on those windows. So uh, where are we with this color? I think we can only assume that it's decorator white and to match the existing windows. But if you mm -hmm. tell us that we can make an, a, an accurate assumption otherwise, um, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be open to hearing that. Um, the intent is to use that paint color that you saw in the little dollop sample and um, match the, the color of the window frame. So I can ask the, um, I can ask the client to have their render Restudy, redo the, the rendering and send it to you again separately after this meeting. I mean, I don't think that's necessary. Thank you. I think you just answered kind of the question, which is that the possibility of it being a more uh, uh, a gentler, less aggressive color apparently doesn't exist, then that the intention here is for it to be this bright white. Okay. But thank you. I should also, I should also note, I mean, if this committee, um, feels they could be supportive of a more gentle cream color, as you say, then that is something they would definitely want to consider as well. So if if that's your opinion, we we would like to know. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Eugene is oh, is there anybody else on the committee who has who would like to do I just want to ask Eugene a question for for our next uh, session. Um, do you have this application that you can show it in the um, business session. Oh, do I have the application? Can you screen share this application in the business session for us? Yes, I should be able to do okay, that. Good. Okay, Um, Thank you, Jackie. Are, are there any other questions in the public, anybody yet? There are actually some questions from the public. Wait, um, I, have one, I have one question before we just do that. By business session, do you mean the end of this meeting? Because I actually made a couple of tweaks to this between when I sent it to Florence and tonight. So should I send it to someone again right now so you have the most up-to-date? Um, send it to Eugene and... Um, yes, let me just send you my email address. Thank you. Do you, want, do you want it to come through me or are you... Because are you, Eugene's probably pretty busy right now. <laughs> well, I just want to be able to share it in the, in the business session, whatever. Whichever you prefer. Okay, Jackie. So I, I sent you my email address in the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. It looks like there are a couple of members of the public who would like to speak. Yes, I believe um I believe the first was actually Sasha Benz. Um let me give uh permission to speak. Hi, how are you? Hello. I am the owner of Wild Blue. I just wanted to mention that. I think that the discrepancy with the white was we're trying to uh, put something forward that you think at the, at the last discussion, you said the bright white was uh, maybe a little bit overwhelming. We were trying to find a color that matched the window frame and also looked uniform for the building. Um, obviously, as you can see, the brick that's showing at the moment is just it's it's a disaster. It just looks like it's been attacked and we're trying to find something that looks clean. But we are absolutely happy to find a color that's you know, the board approves and things looks, you know, better than what we have. And as well, we would be happy to paint the air uh, ducts or replace them with the white frame, the same as the building, whatever um, you think would make the most sense. We're, we're willing to adjust accordingly, you know, to see what you guys would approve. 
Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. I think there was one more person, right? Yes, we do. Uh, another question uh, from Jeffrey Rowland. Um, Jeffrey, you have permission to speak. Uh, yes, I, I'm not offended by the condition of the bricks with the paint removed. And I think it would be an unwise decision to make the same mistake again and paint them. And I particularly think it would be a mistake to paint it white, uh, which presents such an invitation to graffiti artists. I know this because in uh, my area that I live, South Village and so uh, a white wall like this would get tagged within a week. And I just think that the maintenance of it would be ugly uh, because it would be constantly being repainted and painted over and washed off. And I just think it's un unnecessary uh, and not really uh, in any way enhancing to the preservation of the building or the bricks. And as this is a preservation issue, I see no preservation uh, justification for painting the bricks. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, um, we also have another, but I, Sasha is, is uh, raising her hand again. I just wanted to address, because we did discuss the graffiti uh, concern, we do share a wall with the police station and they regularly, you know, frequent walk up and down the block. So we assume that there would be, you know, some type of security there that the, the building wouldn't be graffitied. But we, we have addressed that and we've spoken and they do patrol the street almost every five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, is there anybody else? Doesn't look like it. So I think we can I think we can move on. Thank okay. you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. The next application is 27 Bethune Street. The application is to restore the front facade, build a new two-story extension at the rear, rebuild the second and third floors at the rear facade, add a new non-visible skylight to the front part of the pitched roof, alter the back half of the pitched roof, adding a domer and small roof terrace. When you're ready. Hi, I'm Josh Lecko. I'm the project manager for 20, this uh, project at 27 Bethune Street for Elizabeth Roberts Architects. I'll attempt to be brief and you can ask me as many uh, questions as, as you need to understand the project. Oh, I'm sorry, I should share my screen. So 27 Bethune Street is a, um, a row house. It's part of a group of six row houses from 1836 on Bethune Street. Uh, we're located here, and you can see here in the map, we're in the northern, kind of northwestern part of the Greenwich Village Historic District. Uh, tax photo on this page uh, showing the house in 1940, and then a very blurry photo above uh, in 1980. So looking at the front of the house now, uh, the house has been painted light blue. Um, I'm just going to go straight to that. The house has been painted light blue. There's white sheet metal um, covers over the existing stone lintels, and there's a kind of wood cornice at the top. This is a view of the existing row of what was originally six houses on Bethune Street, starting with number 19 on the left to number 29. Numbers 21 and 23 were altered at some point, uh, raised a story, or raised a half a story to be full, you know, three story uh, buildings. Uh, number 19 Bethune, incidentally, is another Elizabeth Roberts project that we restored um, in 2017 to 2019. And the work that we did on that project with the Landmarks Commission is informing some of the proposals that we're making on this project, particularly as it relates to the facade. So number 19 is here on the left, and 27 Bethune is the blue one. So let's just go straight to the scope of work. This is the existing condition, just showing the house in its context, and this is the facade, you know, orthographic drawing. So the scope of work is to um, remove the paint from the facade, to restore the window lintels uh, to their original stone condition that's seen on the neighboring building. Uh, there's stone beneath the existing sheet metal lintels. Um, 
to restore the wood cornice, repaint it, and uh, to replace the existing membrane roof with a standing seam zinc coated copper roof and to install a skylight on that roof that will be flat to the roof. So it's it will not be visible from the street because the angle of the roof is such that when you stand out on the street, you can't see it. Um, this is a rendering showing the, the proposal again. So the materials uh, standing seam zinc at the roof, the natural brick with the stone, um, cast stone lintels and sills on the main stories, the, restoring the front door and restoring the ironwork at the front. This is the drawing of the proposed skylight on the roof. So you'll see from the skylight, uh, from this sightline elevation that the angle of the roof is such that your line of sight just kind of um, uh, runs along almost at exactly the same angle as the roof. So you cannot see it. For example, there's an existing smaller skylight on the roof now and you cannot see that skylight. So uh, we're proposing a larger one, but it's flat to the roof and it will not be visible. Some views of the uh, existing front door. So the existing front door has a fine Greek revival surround, and we're proposing <laughs> to retain that and just uh, scrape it, repaint it, repair it as needed. Uh, we're proposing to re to replace the neo grec sheet metal lintel with a Greek revival stone lintel that would match the other houses on the row, and the <laughs> front door itself is going to be replaced in, in, with an exact copy of what's there now, just because it's in poor condition. This is showing uh, the door in the tax photo, the door as it exists now, our proposed design, and at the bottom uh, left is the door of 19 Bethune, which was restored in a similar manner um, <laughs> with, with the Landmarks Commission input. There's just some views of the windows showing the uh, sheet metal uh, covers that were put on top of the, cap, the, the original brownstone Greek Revival lintels at some point that we propose to remove. And this is showing the third floor windows that are cut into the um, wood cornice. So this is just going to be painted and repaired. Again, just showing the, the work at the front facade in color. So then moving to the rear of the building, there's uh, three components to work at the rear of the building. We are proposing to build sir, a new- just, Sir, just to keep up with the um, my notes here, I want to be clear. Um, um, one thing on the front before we move on. For sure. The um, entryway and the door are simply being restored, right? The door itself is being replaced, but the entryway and all the surround is being is just existing to remain. It's just being restored. Yeah, okay. I understand about the examples. Thank you. Um, and if I'm going into too much detail, please just tell me to move on. I'm, some of this stuff is some of this stuff is sort of staff level, but it's the, the the way that the commission explained it to me is that it's not necessarily any one particular piece. It's the aggregate total of it is what rises um, to the level of a public exactly. hearing. And we need to know what what we're look the context of what we're looking at particular things for sure. So in the front facade specifically, um, it's replacement of the sheet metal neo grec lintels with stone Greek revival ones. And it's the skylight on the roof. Those are the two big things. All the rest is just staff level restorative work. So I'm sorry if I didn't mean to muddy the waters there. Uh, so going to the back of the building, there's three uh, parts in the scope of work at the back. One is to, uh, to construct a new two-story rear addition. One is to replace the rear facade at the second and third floors in kind with a solid brick wall. Um, it's not a brick veneer, but just a solid brick wall exactly in kind uh, with where, where it is now. And then the third piece is to restructure the, the sloped roof line. So just let's take those pieces in order. This is uh, a context map showing the proposed addition in relation to the other additions on the block. So there's some three-story additions, there's some two-story additions. Uh, and there's a one-story addition at our neighbor's house that we're proposing to align up to. Uh, the proposed addition is eight foot four inches deep, uh, and there's a small bay that protrudes off of it two foot ten inches. So an axon again showing the um, addition. Our uh, project is uh, twenty-seven Bethune, and the other additions are here. Uh, around this block, it's also important to note that there's this block is very heterogeneous. So there's a large apartment building on the uh, east side of the block and there's also large apartment buildings on the west side of the block so there's just a small sort of section of row houses in the middle this is the existing elevation of the rear of the building in context and this is the proposed elevation so it's showing the two-story extension at the bottom 
replacing the brick wall in the second and third floor and restructuring the roof line at the top. Um, I'm gonna focus on the just extension briefly. So this is views of the side of the extension. So this is also the extension is proposed to be built out of solid brick. Um, and so the neighbors would be seeing a brick wall. That's not stuck over EFAS. Uh, and here in color, you see the brick extension with a wood clad bay window, multi-light wood windows, uh, the new wall above uh, with new brick to match the existing brick, which is in poor condition, uh, a cornice at the top to match the um, cornice on the neighbors, and then the zinc coated copper roof and bulkhead at the top. Here's a digital model showing the massing of the rear of the building. So I think the probably the thing on the back of the building that Landmarks has been most focused on is the dormer and uh, sort of reverse dormer, I guess you could call it terrace. It's cut into the roof line of the building. So looking at the image in the upper left, you can see that the uh, dormer is similar in size to the dormer on the neighboring building. It's actually not quite as wide. Uh, it doesn't span the full width. There is roof line in the original plane that is uh, remains on either side of it per uh, our landmarks uh, preservationist recommendation. Uh, the roof dormer itself would be clad in the same zinc as the roofing. So it's all sort of one monolithic piece. And then the terrace is a relatively modest six foot deep terrace that's just cut into the roof line. This entire structure is below the um, it meets and is below the, the ridge of the roof, so none of it is visible from the street. Going to the next page, this is just some views of the condition of the existing back wall. It's in relatively poor condition. It's been patched with lots of different kinds of brick. Um, you can see here that there have been windows that have been boarded up with CMU. Uh, the wall's bulging in places. There's a lot of bad pointing, um, patchy brickwork. This is the existing, let's just go to the proposed. This is the proposed building section. So the work at the back again is the two-story um, extension at the rear uh, and the, the work at the top. And you can see how it sort of extends out the roof line and then cuts into it to create a small uh, roof terrace. And then I think I just wanted to conclude by showing you in context two other projects which have been approved on this block. So it's at 105, 107 Bank Street. Uh, which is at the left of this page, and 109 Bank Street. So 109 Bank Street is uh, under construction now. It's nearly complete. The scope of work was similar. It involved a two-story rear extension and an extension on the roof. 105, 107 Bank Street, I believe, were uh, recently approved at public hearing. And uh, this involves a much larger scope where they're completely rebuilding the backs of the buildings, extending them out at all floors, building new extensions on the top, and also excavating the entire footprint of the lot, you know, within five feet of the property line to install a new um, tall sub cellar. So uh, I think our project is contextual and smaller than what is going on in the, in the neighboring properties. And following this, there's a, a bunch of pages of detailed information that relates to the windows um, and other sort of staff level information. But if you want to talk about it, it's here. So I think at that point, I'll conclude and I'll turn it over to questions. Okay, thank you. Um, the um, would you go back to the rear dormer? Is this page what you had in mind? Right, that, that's right. Is there one that shows the existing in some way? Oh, the neighbors. Yes, for sure. Let me just no, no, the, no, your, the existing rear roof where the dormer is now. Oh yeah, here. Of let me just dormer. go back. So because the roof is pitched and the lot is not especially deep, it's hard to, you, you can't really see the, the pitch roof. I see. So it's just simply introducing a dormer into the pitch that's there. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, okay, um, questions from the committee? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Do, do you know when the front facade lentils or trim was changed from the stone to the metal? We don't have an exact date. We think, um, talking to our landmarks preservationists, that it's of a neo greek date. So we're thinking late 19th century based on the, maybe should I go back to that page? Um, 
based upon the kind of uh, decorative triangular sort of details on this, you know, piece above the door, we're thinking this is late 19th century, but we can't be absolutely certain. Because uh, two or three of the neighbors on that street have the same details on their facade. That's true. They're similar. They're not dissimilar. Let's go back to this page. So this how the yeah, the house on the you're right. So the house on the right and the house on the left have the stone, and the four houses in the middle have the sheet metal. Also, then have. Uh, I think there were some drawings where uh, you say that the door surround is going to remain, which is good, including the transom, I take it, because there was somewhere along the line, there was a drawing or a, a rendering that seemed to indicate that the transom was getting smaller, but that's not the case, is it? No, the transom intended were, I mean, it might need to be reglazed because it's in, not in very good shape, but it's the transom is, we're intending to keep it. Well, it makes sense to reglaze it so that you, for energy, if nothing else. Um, and then uh, the lighting in the, at the front door is, is also going to change. That's and correct. The, um, you, I, I believe that this rendering, it's on screen right now, is different than the example of the lighting that is shown in the details. And um, uh, neither one is all that great i don't think but uh, it's <laughs> all right <laughs> probably a minor detail and i don't know if uh, there's it it's not totally a historic but it's it just they they don't seem like it would be a, a great enhancement to the all the other work that's being done so i'm just kind of wondered if what was the purpose of choosing the kinds of lighting that you are showing us? You know, I think uh, in all honesty, it has not been a real focus of discussions with landmarks and probably not with the clients either, to be fair. And so I think we'd be open to, we'd certainly be open to changing the lighting. I think that the lighting on either side of the door, uh, there are places here where you can see where there used to be lighting mounted there. So we do we do think that that's where the lighting used to be. Um, and we plan to put lighting back in the original location. But in terms of the actual fixture choice, I think we're certainly flexible. We could put back something um, that the committee deems to be more appropriate. Okay, I think that's all that I had. Thank you. Are there others who wish to speak question? Yeah, Brendan, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Okay, thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'm confused about. Um, sure. Are you, so one sheet shows that a completely uh, reconfigured um, vestibule that, with the, the pilasters on the corner being removed. Um, and I'm just confused because then I think I see another sheet um, where it describes says they're going to remain. I'm, I guess I'm wondering, are you looking at this drawing here on the top? Um, Is this proposed design? Let's see. That's uh, 110. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it maybe is just a graphic error on our part, to be honest with you, because the intention is not is is just to leave it. We're um, not proposing to alter that door surround. Okay. We don't, we, we want to just, I mean, I think it probably requires repair. It's got a million layers of paint on it. So right. yeah, I it saw might, it. it was pretty impressively painted. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty encrusted, but I think there's a, <laughs> I think we think there's a door surround under there. So we'd like to yeah. keep it. Um, it's, it looks solid. Um, now you kept the door. It's cool that you got, that you did 19. Um, so you're familiar that, so you restored the the nineteen door. Are you going to replace this one? I think I the, saw. Uh, the, we're going to replace the store. The door on nineteen is also replaced. The surround was restored, but the door was replaced. So maybe I was looking at. Okay. Now, do you need to replace that? It it seem, doesn't seem like it's damaged beyond reasonable repair. I mean, I think that the mail slot cut through the panel right in the middle of the door is pretty unfortunate. Um, it's certainly not a place of, I would put a mail slot if I had a choice <laughs> about it. Um, so, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a bit rotten. It's, we have to change the hardware. So I think that we would just prefer to have a solid door um, without a hole cut in it. Um, but, you know, if that was a sticking point, obviously, then clearly we, we want to be flexible and we want to not do something inappropriate. Um, okay, so another question is, um, so you're matching um, 29 with the, um, like the pediment style lintels. Yeah. But why not match um, 19? Because one thing that well, they're I- They're actually, they're very simple. They're almost the same, actually. Let's look at it. So um, maybe it would be helpful to, is this, does that work if I zoom in like this? Oh, I'm looking at, at like 106 right now. It just the reason why uh, sheet 106. The reason why um, I'm asking is because um, these are taller on um, on 29. I see. So because when I was when I was looking at the site, I was like, how I, I couldn't figure out how the the, um, the brownstone would fit underneath those um, applied cornices. Um, oh, I think they actually the applied cornices are pretty tall. I think I think it's uh, well, at least so. My my yeah, uh, my sense is that they that they put these applied cornices in place because probably the underlying brownstone was damaged. We did a house on West 12th Street a couple of years ago, and we didn't want to take these things off, but we had to because there was like some repairs that needed to be done. And once we got under them, it was like, oh, the brownstone was all rotten and it was you know cracked, and that's probably why they put them up in the first place. So then they all had to come off and then we had to replace the brownstone. And it was like, well, why are we gonna put sheet metal back in front of the brand new brownstone that we just had to install? So it just seemed to make more sense to restore it back to its original condition, given that I think a certain amount of repair is required regardless of what uh, what the final intended appearance is. That's, that's, that's interesting. Do you have any idea when those were those sheet metal uh, was put up on them? Oh, it was 341 was four, 40. Oh yeah, it was definitely before 40 because they're in the pictures, but they were just sort of, you know, rusted out sheet metal. Yeah. It didn't look too bad until you got up, you know, close and started poking around at it. But then it was, anyway, it was, the point was it was concealing water damage. And so got we it. took them off and then it was like, well, here we are. Mm -hmm. What do we restore this back to? And so that's the thought process that um, has been driving this. Got it. And then the, um, the, cornice with the end brackets uh, above the doorway. Yeah. Um, you're removing that. That is our intention. We'd like to put it back to match the the door at the neighboring building, the sort of um, neo greco style, not neo greco I apologize, uh, Greek Revival style um, pediment at 29 Bethune. Yeah. I mean, this is this is pretty interesting, though, as as a like historical moment, um, and because it because they've been applied to the other buildings, um, the uh, and this one has this interesting sawtooth um, relief pattern. Um, so uh, I know it's not in the most awesome repair, but. <laughs> The cast iron, you know, is intact. I don't know about the joints in the cornice. I don't, yeah. is, that, I don't, is that cast iron or is that is that sheet? It's sheet metal. Mm -hmm. But the brackets themselves, they look- I believe the whole thing is sheet metal. Cool. I mean, I will say that this has been, um, uh, this, this issue has been a trick. Uh, I don't know. We've had a lot of debate about it. <laughs> yeah. So I think I don't think this is the easiest decision. I can under I can we can see arguments favor in you know both cases, but our preference is to put it back to being stone. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, you're changing the pattern on the on the third floor windows of the of the um, the sashes. Is that is that true? I'm sorry. Let me just go to this page. Um, we're we're putting the well, the second and so the, the original windows in the house are six over six. And then at some point there were these replacement four over four windows added. Um, and so we just want to return everything to the three panes wide, um, which is how we arrived at the, the fenestration that we're proposing. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around the pages here. There's no, that's just, fine. That's fine. Um, and that also matches with what's on 29 Bethune. Yeah. 
I mean, it, these windows are a bit odd. You know, it's it's hard to know what the original windows were because they might not have even been that shape. Right, right. Um, and then, do uh, you absolutely got to replace the ground floor windows? Do we have to replace them? You yeah. mean, could we just leave the existing windows? Yes, the sashes. I mean, I I think to be honest with you, we're really unwilling to do that given that they're single glazed windows and we want the house to have better energy performance. Yeah, I mean, there's other ways to, to get better energy performance. Um, but uh, yes, I'm just, it's, it's, we're just losing them all over the place and energy performance is, is kind of debatable. We can discuss this in the yeah, sure. executive, executive, excuse um, me. That's Sorry. cool. Um, thank you very much, Josh. Oh, you're welcome. Are there any other questions from the committee? Are there board or neighbor questions? And finally, does anyone have any testimonies to bear on our uh, discussions in the business session that need to be spoken of now? Okay, thank you all. I understand now about the visibility of, from the note that I sent earlier, um, Josh. So that was clear from the presentation. Great. Okay. okay. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. The uh, Lafayette Street has uh, will be done by staff so that it does not appear at this session. So we've concluded the public session. And now may we go to the business session without objection, as they say. Um, the first one is Sixth Avenue, uh, the sign. Um, there was a great deal of discussion, all of which was that the that letter is too big. We need to come up with something to say. Um, my suggestion is just that there be more space between the top and the bottom and whatever size it turns out to be, it turns out to be. Does anyone have other? Yes. Am, am I working properly? What? Uh, yeah, both. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, the rules are what they are, you know? So what? I think we should enforce the rule and not redesign the sign. I mean, it's just, it's it. their proposal does not conform with existing rules. Um, they should come back with something else. I don't, I don't think we're, we're we have, as I just said, I don't think we have to redesign the sign. We just have to reject it. Other comments? That does sound legitimate, what uh, Bo's comment. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's a consistent issue here to what degree we, you know, in a historic district, bend to uh, adapt to pre existing corporate logos that were never designed with any consideration that they might one day be in an historic district. And I think, you know, I, I don't like the precedent of the tail wagging the dog on, on this. And yet I am sympathetic to the needs of the business owner. But I do think that, you know, at very least, that logo needs to be adapted because it is too big. The O is too big, you know, and I think it's sort of like the tail is wagging the dog here. On, on The O is wagging the dog. Um, so I know that I would be okay with either um, reaching a compromise, which is the one that you suggested, Chenault, or just rejecting it, but that I am not comfortable with it as, as presented, um, you know, if you, anywhere you travel where they're in else, I mean, if you're in Europe and you're in cities with, where there's McDonald's, you know, in a historic district in, you know, in Rome or Paris or wherever, 
you, you see that the logos are adapted to suit the environment. Now, granted, sick, that particular stretch of Sixth Avenue, you know, is not the most uh, gorgeous, you know, <laughs> example of historic architecture in our district. But I, I do think that this, the, that we just have to be very careful about how we handle um, corporate branding in a historic district. My boilerplate is the six inch golden arches on the Champs-Élysées. <laughs> um, she spoke about if the whole thing were reduced to keep the same proportion of the big and the, that the, the other letters would look strange because they'd be so incredibly tiny. I mean, I think that falls under the self-imposed hardship. Uh, <laughs> but then we're left with, with, has her we're hand left with up. ugly, tiny letters. So <laughs> what do we do? So the, the two things have been proposed, to reduce the whole thing to conform to the regulations or to reduce the logo letter to three quarters of what it is or something like yes. that. Yes, Chanel, do you see that Susan's hand is up? So the other Susan's hand is oh, up. Okay. Susan. Hi, yeah, I, I, I really have to, I mean, I don't want to, of course, you guys are the experts, but I really feel I have to point out here that you've got an applicant that may not have a choice. Um, this, that, that sign, that name is a mark. It is a registered brand mark. Um, they probably don't, if, especially if this is a franchise, they do not have a legal right to change it. There, 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 there are all kinds of agreements that they've committed to maintaining it. And if you force them, if you try to force them to change it and they were to agree to it, they would be in violation of their business agreements. So there's a lot of things that are behind this that would alter their ability. I don't know if this is part of simply a corporate change or it is a franchise, but that mark is um, the proportions of the letters to one another is an essential aspect of that. And they can't just change it. I mean, maybe this is the wrong place for them because they're in a historic district, but it's um, there's there are other issues. I don't know because the presenter didn't talk about this at all, what they can and can't do. And maybe she doesn't recognize that, that. but, okay, you know, Okay, that's not something that we would consider at all because it doesn't fall under under the landmarks. It's not a we it simply can't consider that. Um, we're we're very strict about what we're considering the criteria and the area and. No, uh, no, I recognize that. Design. It just wouldn't. It's just not part of our discussion. Okay. Um, can we go back to the committee now? What we have to decide which to do. We have two proposals to reduce the um, size of the letter or to keep the proportions as suggested by the um, applicant and reduce the whole thing. No, 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 I don't think that's true, Chanel. I think we just have to reject it. And going also to Susan's comment, you know, they they may not have the ability to to change the sign. That's not a part of the discussion. What they have the ability to do. We we make discussions based on landmarks considerations. That's what I'm saying. That's why we have to. That's exactly what I said. Right. That's why we have and, to reject and, it. And you you object then to it's being reduced to conform to regulations, which which is. I don't think we can do either. No, we, we just have to reject their application. They can come back with any solution they want to propose, but we, we don't redesign their sign. And I would agree with Bo that we are rejecting it as they have submitted it to us because it does not conform with the rules of the historic district. And so that would be enough to guide them into their choices of how they would uh, resolve it. And we, if we say that we do that because it doesn't conform to the regulations, then we're, that's our, we have to have a justification for rejecting it. 
Yes, that and would be the constant. We said that as a form to start district regulations. Exactly. Um, is that agreeable to everyone? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you look like you're in the outer space of <laughs> your lighting. <laughs> um, okay, that, that's settled then. We reject it because it doesn't conform to the regulation. Um, the next is 101 Green Street. Um, this is the first time we've ever had this kind of a proposal. Usually the flags are enormous. And that's the discussion of, is there an objection to essentially changing the material of the sun from one material to another? No, I, I think I, I, we have to reject it because to my recollection, any, any um, request for a flag was just that. People came, they requested a flag. A blade sign is a completely different thing. And the blade sign is characteristic of Soho. And they're up and down the street and he incorrectly stated that most of the signs are fabric and not hard material. And that's, that's absolutely incorrect. I, I just am I was shocked by that. So I think it's, we should maintain, I think the blade signs look great. They're all close to the same size, not, but not exactly the same size. And they should just stick to the blade sign. Uh, I don't know what the rules are exactly when, when people ask for a, for a flag, but it's, it's a different situation. And the, in, in this case, it's not a simple swapping out hard material for soft material. It, it, it's a completely different thing. And I, I think they need to stick to the blade side. Okay. The we have approved a number of flags that are far bigger than this. I know that's what I, I just said that. What I'm saying is they didn't- we've approved it, that we've <laughs> approved them. So our precedent is to consider flags. And I don't recall that we've ever rejected a flag. We've asked we're not rejecting a flag. We're rejecting their proposal. Well, well, no, we're rejecting a flag. No, we're not. We're they're proposing they, a flag. They did, not, they did not propose the installation of a flag. They proposed changing the material of a blade sign from a hard material to a fabric material. So they can take down anything they want to take down. We don't approve the taking down of a blade sign. They'll do that. Then what they want to put up in their store is a flag. It's that's not a point of discussion. That simply is a fact. So they have proposed a flag. Do we approve this flag or do we not approve this flag? That's what's before us. Oh right, well, I would not approve. Okay. Does anyone else object to the proposal as given? I'm just super confused, so I guess I'm going to abstain. I... Okay. Uh, does anyone object to anyone else object to the? Valerie and Brian have their hands up, and I okay very much like to hear what they have to say. Okay, speak. I just want to comment before uh, opining on my uh, how I see this. Um, I wanted to share in the chat the um, the resolution on this one from May 2021 that we denied um, for, if you recall, had all of the mirrored cladding. So I'm just sharing that so that the committee could have- Well, just to sum up what it is, if you will. Oh, uh, sure. It's, um, sure, if anyone wants to look at it, it's on page two. Um, so we, uh, uh, we said that the proposed blade sign was not similar to those on the street of the neighborhood with a heavy wooden support and rigid connection to the sign below and is not freely suspended. And we also said that the blades, the blade signs large size was not represented as conforming to the regulations of size for the building and in the district now. And we, um, we uh, denied the application and we also specifically in the therefore be it resolved um, called out the covering of historic metal or historical materials with reflective stainless steel, unsuitable and destructive to the building and disrespectful of the historic character of the building and of the district. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Thank you, oh, Valerie. 
seems the other people want Brian, to Brian, yes, Brian would like to speak. So that means that uh, we rejected their application for this sign that we see today. And in existing on the stainless steel and reflective and all the rest. So I guess LPC overruled us on that. Is that what it is you showed, Valerie? I'm not surprised. Is that, what uh, that appears so. You're right. We were, um, the application last time did include the new signage. Yeah. Okay. So what does does anyone know exactly what the wording is as far as a flag, uh, this fabric type of sign that's being proposed? Is is there some prohibition? No, we have we have approved flags and we have approved blade signs and we have disapproved them depending on their individual characteristics. This one clearly we based it primarily on the um, material. It seems. We recommend uh, um, again. Uh, so if we can just focus on what's before us, which is a flag of this, what for flags is a modest size, then we'll that's what's before us. Well, if if you're saying that in fact there the regulations do not prohibit this to be a fabric type sign or flag, then I can't really vote against it there they're regular and uh, there are regulations but um this to my mind is um and from experience is far far smaller than what you would think of as a flag which usually fly from a a um, often from an angled staff and high above and can be as much as a good portion of a story high um, does anyone else have comments on this? Um, I, I have a, I guess, a question, um, and you may have answered it, but does the definition of a flag mean that it must be on an angled no. uh, support? It does not. So it can be on the armature as it is. It's, it's, it's mainly the size that's different. I don't recall them. What we always say that provided that it, conforms to the regulations for the building and the district. Okay. And put it back in uh, landmarks to approve to verify that. And usually the staff are, are good at um, catching them on too big or too long or too something before it comes to us. So I think it's rarely, it's rare that we've had a non-conforming one. All right, thanks. Yeah, Chenault, I would be inclined to um, solve this by suggesting what you essentially just suggested, um, which is that if LPC can confirm that this meets this, their standards for a flag, you know, then I would not object to it. I think the thing here is, as Bo has rightfully pointed out, you know, is it a is it a blade sign? Is it a flag? Like, what is it? You know, and um, there is ample. Um, even though we prefer blade signs, there are many examples of flags in the district. So to out and out say no, you can't have a flag. You know, I don't think we have a position. What it really is is a cloth blade sign, but that there's no such thing. So I think, you know, we need to rely on LPC's um, uh, evaluation of whether this would meet their standards for a flag. And if in any way it does not, then we need to say then we reject it. Yeah, yeah that, that's okay. And we do the same thing for painted signs and saying that they, they have to they have to verify that inch for inch and proportion and so forth. Uh, so who, yeah, who is opposed to this if we if hey, we hang on a section all because Zachary hasn't spoken yet. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just <laughs> I know there's been a lot of discussion of blade sign, flag, etc. But if it's a cloth blade sign, which honestly to me is what it looks like, 
<laughs> that just to me is a small version of a flag. And I, I don't know why we're getting so hung up on these categories. Is the idea that if it were much bigger and clearly a flag, we would be able to approve it, but we can't because it looks like a blade sign. I'm that's where I'm a little bit lost. I'm I'm not really understanding why calling it one thing or the other when it's a square of cloth that has a name on it really matters all that much. That's I don't know. I, I so I'm a little lost here. So I'll, I'll yeah, that's all I'll say. Our objections have been to the size of flags, as I recall maybe occasionally that they were too bright or something but basically and and flag meaning flag like a flag you fly it for the yeah. um uh, uh who is other than in favor of approving this provided that staff approve um see that it follows the regulations Bo, are you, are you opposing it? No, I'm OK. Just okay. the way you described it. And but Brian, are you upset? I'm supporting what Susan's solution was. Which is what we always do anyway, so it's, it works. Um, Brian, are you abstaining? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm voting in favor, but uh, I think Brendan was. Uh, Brendan, are you abstaining? Somebody was. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm less confused now. I'm voting in favor. Thank you. Okay, oh, everyone's in favor. Um, Bleecker Street. Um, if we, uh, Susan, you do it because I'm going to speak. Um, okay, well, you know, this is a very tricky one because we've already, oh, Bo, yeah. Go ahead. Well, one thing, you know, it, my recollection is at the end, the last time we voted on this, right at the end, somebody looked up something. I think it might have been Carter. And, and it. I think we were under the impression that this was a, not a significant building. And then somebody cited something, maybe it was Brian, uh, it, that indicated that this uh, 1963 or so building was, in fact, uh, considered significant in some way. And uh, I believe, uh, maybe Brian, do you remember that? But, but anyway, the thing is that my immediate, my original approval of painting it white, whether we can revisit this or not, I don't know, but was that it was okay, it was a non-contributing building and it, you know, it wasn't sort of, it's not bad looking, I don't think it looks bad. It's a question of whether it's the right thing to do. And I think maybe somebody remembers, but there was something introduced right at the end of, of right at the end, right before we, we approved it the last time that indicated that this building is in fact somewhat significant uh, architecturally. So, I mean, based on that, you know, we should take another look at it. I think if anybody can support that. I, I, I read that and it, it, it said in reviewing it, uh, the go building by building of the designation report that it was in fact um significant of its it represented its time something like that yes right something like that right. so that isn't the same as non-contributing you know valerie right yeah. right um so it uh, this building 350 bleaker uh, is designated as um uh, having significance in the Greenwich Village Historic District Report. Also, um, in past CB2 resolutions, particularly May 1986, we had said 4350 Bleecker Street, whereas this 1963 structure is one almost unique in the Greenwich Village Historic District in that it its flat painted panels and strong straight lines embody a popular style of the mid 20th century. Right. So given that, I mean, that, that my, my, that's my question. I mean, can we, should we revisit the original approval of the white? Because there is, there is a significant point there that there, there's no uh, architectural demarcation uh, between what they propose to paint white and what would be above it. They're just stopping in one uh, brick line, you know, one uh, mortar line. And uh, that's, that's kind of unusual. It really is. It's unusual. Yeah, I thought that was a great point that you made, Chenault, on that, the that kind of arbitrary demarcation. And I think, you know, 
-hmm. the question is can we revise you know can we open this discussion up to a revision of the approval of the lighter color at all and if we can i would suggest that we do for a couple of reasons one of which is the point that you brought up chenault another is that um although last time around the applicant uh not the applicant's representative, but the actual applicant, you know, verbally represented a willingness to modify what was clearly a, a desire for a bright white into something more amenable. And yet all this time has passed and that hasn't been accommodated in the, uh, in the proposal. And, you know, that doesn't um, fit very well this, either. Sorry, may I respond? or amplify um, this was not presented as a modification of some aspect this was presented tonight as a new application and the whole thing was presented um i would i would um, argue that the what we do tonight replaces not modifies the previous resolution just as a as a policy because they presented it and we can um this new information i think we're considering more seriously now the um significance of the building itself that certainly was my understanding of what was presented tonight that this was a new presentation pre-approval that that we are stuck with and that's and they, why I, and they I, made no reference to the to the previous one, yeah. and so, uh, and they haven't. And it's kosher community. for us to reopen this conversation, which it seems that it is. Then I suggest that we reopen it based on you know a few things that we've learned since we originally uh, discussed this. I agree. Yes. Yes. I think I see four major points of discussion. One is the color of the brick, the paint. Uh, the next one is the size of the pin mounted signs. And the third is the whether the planter gets painted or not. And the fourth is the uh, gold foil signs in the windows applied to the glass. <laughs> and so I personally have a, a continuing objection to a bright white paint. And I have an objection to increase the size of the signs, those pin mounted signs. Uh, they're already lit or they're halo and with everything else going on, I think they are sufficient size. Oh, and I, I do believe that the point was made in the presentation that the existing signs are um, conforming to the rules of the size of the sign the new signs would be bigger and would not conform so i don't i don't see any choice there of uh but to reject that yeah the difference in the size of the sign is something that we discussed last time and we didn't we weren't good with it then and i think one other aspect brian is also the shiny metal because it's a polished metal right so i that's right i would reject that part of it but i i'd say keep the signs as they are. Brian mentioned the planter. Was that part of our previous resolution? I believe it was, yes. I think it yes. was, yes. that it should not be painted. Right, we felt that way previously. Um, I think we should call it the Albert planter. <laughs> I'd like to give my testimony when it's appropriate. Go. <laughs> Can I speak? Please. <laughs> um, it's a modification. Of, it's stretching what Brian said. Um, to my point that I brought up to the applicant, if you look at the picture of the way it is now, it looks like the building that was designed painting it anything other than brick color or indeed painting it at all is 
um, a violation of the building. The somehow the one beside it, because it doesn't turn the corner and is a dark color, is less offensive than the white and the white turning the corner. And um, I would hold that it shouldn't be painted. And certainly the sign, based on our discussion of the first application, um, has to conform. And it's not so much bigger, it's like a thing to make it bigger. The size and the, and the conforming and the proposed is not vastly different and is probably not going to make a difference of a single person stepping in the door. Brendan, your hand is up. Yeah, so I remember the I remember when uh, we looked at the Google Maps and we discovered that the building was pretty interesting, but we didn't realize as as Chanel you just mentioned that it, it was actually noted as significant. So that kind of changes the conversation a little bit. Now, it has um, painted swaths. Of, of the brick courses, and I believe they're painted. Um, is there a symmetry to the corners um, in terms of um, were they painted at one point to match or were they, were they brick? Because I remember that landmarks made them sandblast and they did a bad job. And that's why it's kind of modeled right now. So remember they're, they're being, they were in a tricky spot. Um, and we might've said, no, this should, the black should have stayed. Does anybody um, remember this? Uh, oh. Brenda, what did, what did you mean by the symmetrical corners? Do you mean- uh, the, the other the, side of the building. Yeah, the north end of the building is, is totally different. It doesn't have any commercial uh, windows or anything like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's residential wrapping around the other sides. Okay. Does anyone know if it was always commercial at this corner? It just occurred to me. To, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't, uh, all the pictures I've seen have shown some storefronts there. Uh, it's been as, as long as I remember, which is from 72, not that long after it was built. Um, Valerie, Valerie's got her hand up. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted, first of all, I wanted to, I'm, I'm really thankful that we're revisiting this one in light of the new information presented and also that we're, since it was presented as a full application again, um, that we can revisit it. I also wanted to point out, I'm gonna put in the chat, um, the resolution from January, uh, it starts on page two. And um, I wanna point out that the this original resolution when it was presented, um, that full board in January had a, a full board. <laughs> yeah, well not, but my, my fact will not be on the record. Didn't want to hear you, no. <laughs> we were not, happy to I, hear I didn't you. Know if I did that, but anyways. Um, so anyways, I just want to, I want to share that. Um, I had voted against the cream color in committee and I did vote against it at full board and there were eight no votes at full board. Thanks. Um, we've discussed this to death and to a good end. Uh, and Valerie has concluded it very nicely. Um, could we simply go uh, along the um, the four items and um, see where we stand? Is there anyone opposed? Well, we keep talking about the color. Is, th is there anyone in favor of not painting it? which is to say restoring the brick or leaving the brick as it is a little bit different the building. I think I am. And what? To either restoring or leaving as it is. Okay. Does anyone object to unpainted brick? That seems to settle the color. Um, does anyone object to the sign remaining on um, the size that it is, which is within, which conforms to the um, regulations? Okay. 
Um, and I'm, we're taking that to include the planter as a non-painted thing, obviously. No brick is to be painted, is what we're saying. Um, the four letters, is there objection to them? Brian, what was your fourth point or did it get folded into something else? Did we revisit the size of the pin mounted signs? Yes, that they stay. Okay, uh, well, paint color uh, and painting the planter and the foil signs oh, on the, the, the planter. Tiny you, metal. You put out the planter separate then. So all brick right. to remain unplanted, unpainted, um, the sign to remain at its present size, and the four letters are okay. And we also are not in favor of a polished gold there. Uh, polished, uh, uh, oh, that, that's the sign itself. So it should be a dulled gold. Yeah, if they change the pinpoint, the pin mounted sign, they were going to change it to a shiny gold. Right. Right now it's a duller finish. And if we are saying, we're rejecting the new signs then okay. well it's good to point it out thank you we reject uh, the, uh, i think maybe we should point it out anyway in case landmarks goes with approving the larger sign yeah all right this one say dull gold is that a way of is that a matt 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 oh well capitalized matt <laughs> Whoever are you. these are you dealing with major difference what? from the previous resolution we're essentially scrapping the previous resolution should that be noted uh no because this was a they, they made a new one tonight so we it just doesn't exist okay it has many similarities, Albert. The most, the notable difference is the rejection of that white cream, the, whatever you want, painting, potato, potato color. Painting period or exclamation point. And I must say it's been a pleasure to walk by it, which I do almost every day and see it not jumping out in some painted way. So. Um, I think we're clear on this and we're clear on everything. Um, again, we got caught with re with additions and rejections, which is why we're two meetings. Um, the uh, next meeting is a brief. There's one brownstone of similar to the one we had. And um, there's a report from the uh, city about What's the, it old about? Merchants, the old merchants, the old merchants, uh, the old uh, merchants. Yeah, uh, which is is basically just um, restoration and repair. I'm not even sure why we're hearing it, but we're hearing it. Report from the parks department, yeah. actually. So uh, we haven't done the 27 Bethune yet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got so excited about bleak. <laughs> um, I just scrolled right by it. Okay, um, let's go um, section by section. The the front facade was discussed a great deal, and I, in the end, is there something that should not be approved? Uh, yeah, I'd like to um, reject the replacement of the door. I. It has to be according to um, Title 69, beyond reasonable repair. And that doesn't seem the case to me from looking at it. Well, um, it, it, uh, we can say that, but I think we need to say it provided that it is. Is what? Is beyond repair. No, it's not beyond repair. No, I mean, we can't take your seeing it without inspecting it as the verification for that. Understood. Say that 
uh, um, if it uh, that we don't that we could not approve its replacement, provided that is indeed not beyond repair. Sure. Um, it's a question of how we word it. Very good. Yeah, I was confused because there were two separate. Um, there was an earlier um, submission. If there are two submissions, yeah. the earlier one is out and the new one is in. Oh, well, no, I understood, but we just got the new one today. So I went and did a, well, sent you all an email. You know, that's not infrequent, as we, as we said before. Um, let me just note the two remain. Um, and um, that we want to ensure that the lighting fixtures are proper historic design. Yes. Um, anything else for the front? I guess there's the question Valerie. of remo remove. Oh, ahead, uh, we certainly would not object to going back to original, whatever that involved, um, as with the windows and so forth original design with good reason for replacing them. Um, then the rear, uh, the extension at the bottom with the wooden bay window. Excuse me, Chanel, before we move on to something else, there's a hand up. Valerie. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to propose adding in the whereas as a statement of fact, um, that this is just to point um, that this is a, or this is a a reduction. This is three residential unit. Just stating as a fact of what it is, it's three residential units being combined into one um, household. Or I don't know what the exact terminology is. Right, right. What does that have to do with the landmarks? Um, I think it's important. It's just a statement of fact of what it is. Um, it's a fact about the building, and I think that it's important for the larger. Um, I think it's important for the larger conversation of the board around housing that um, that with the governor's proposed um, housing plan that we will that every community district will be responsible for. Um, I know I understand it's not a discussion for landmarks, but I think it's important for the work that we see here in landmarks. We are seeing the consolidation of units, and we just I think it's important for us to just mark it as a fact statement of a fact of what it is. Um, um. Yeah, I, I agree. We have to tie it some way. Um, yeah, don't we always describe we can, say it's, we can say that it's a row house, um, a multifamily row house being converted to a single family. So uh, there's a, it's a, a multiple dwelling re returned to a single family. Sure. Dwelling. Yeah, so that it's not pejorative. And here you. it can be pejorative to death. Right. Just to just a statement of what it is. That way this information is just on the record, and that way the other committees, um, such as land use um, and housing, can use that um in, in their work. So just exactly. thank you. That's great. And they always say that in their applications, anyhow. So the the uh, sponsors are up with that. Um so that's a back to the rear. Um, the bottom floors with the wooden bay windows, which actually had precedent two doors down or so. That's all okay. It seemed the appropriate. Floors, the upper floors conform to our eternal request of um, keeping them original and the brick needs to be replaced. And um, I heard no objections to inserting the dormer into the pitch roof. No. Oh, the skylight. Uh... I would like to congratulate him on, he used the word contextual. <laughs> and I'm going to use the forbidden word. This is probably the most appropriate 
Labor Yard extension that I have seen in 25 years. Oh, it's not appropriate. It's not uh, inappropriate to use appropriate anymore. <laughs> oh, you changed okay. the rules. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, I would like to thank him. In the end, no one agreed with any. It was all unanimous, right? What's the language for the door again? The what? The, front door? the what? The language you're proposing for the front door replacement? That, that, it, it, um, that, that it replace provided that it's found to be in that repair, beyond repair. Whatever. Beyond reasonable repair. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, anyone else have anything? Okay, thank you. And um, we'll see you again on Monday. See you Monday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.